All right, can everyone hear me? Yes. We have a couple people signed on to Facebook waiting for us to start. So I'm going to pull up your PowerPoint to get us started. And in the meantime, I'll pass it off to David Morrison, our director, and Dorothy King, who chairs our educational committee to get us started. Great. Thank you very much, Ashley. Uh, this is David Morrison, Executive Director of Historic Harrisburg Association. We want to thank those of you who have tuned in this evening to our virtual presentation of our fourth Monday program, uh, which Dorothy King, our Education Chairman, will introduce in just a moment. Uh, many of you are familiar with Historic Harrisburg, and you know that we have been promoting historic preservation, urban revitalization, and smart growth since 1973. And we've been presenting these fourth Monday programs for just about that entire 48 year period. Uh, it's a long running educational program. A great variety of subjects have been presented. Uh, also, uh, since 1973, with the exception of last year and this year, Historic Harrisburg has presented the annual Candlelight House Tour, one of the largest uh, and, and most widely attended uh, house tours in the Eastern United States. Unfortunately, again, this year, we will not be presenting uh, the tour due to uh, concerns people have uh, about uh, the pandemic. Uh, we're working on a lot of other programming uh, to keep people engaged, and we always look for ideas uh, from our members and from the public. Um, the, coming up a month from tonight, uh, on Monday, uh, uh, October 25th, the, the program will take place at the State Museum of Pennsylvania, and it will be about the architecture of the State Museum, which is mid-century modern architecture, a great style of architecture from the middle of the 20th century. You'll get more information about that from our website and an upcoming uh, email blast. And then in November, our program is uh, landmarks of local journalism. And we've got uh, representatives of the Patriot News, the Central Penn Business Journal, and the Berg, as well as a couple of our uh, resident historians, Ken Fru and Jeb Stewart, talking about the places where local news uh, was generated, uh, the local publishing houses. It's a fascinating subject, and we think that will be a very interesting program uh, in the end of November. Uh, at the first weekend in December, 
is our annual Elegant Progressions Progressive Dinner. And that uh, it will be Friday, December 3rd or Saturday, December 4th. You have your choice of evenings and you can go to elegantprogressions.org to find out more about it and to purchase your tickets. So with that, I'd like to introduce the chairman of H Historic Harrisburg's Education Committee, the committee that organizes all of these programs as well as walking tours and other educational activities that occur and are presented, many of them free of charge uh, throughout the year. The chairman of our Education Committee, Dr. Dorothy King. Take it away, Dorothy. Thank you, David. Hello and welcome. Um, I usually ask the question, how many of you are visiting us for the first time? Raise your hand. Well, I can't see your hands raised, but I'm sure there are many of you who are coming to us for the first time and we're so excited and thank you for being here. And you old timers, not, not in age, just in <laughs> visitation, you old timers, we're glad that you're here with us also. And we uh, as David pointed out, we've got two more education programs that we're very excited about coming up uh, in the next two months, and we hope that you will uh, take part in them also. I am very excited to introduce you to Gloria Merrick. Uh, Gloria and I were talking about this program a year ago. I remember speaking with her and saying, we want you to do a program in September and uh, September of this year. And she was very excited and she said, yes, I would love to do it. So I'm very excited that now we get to hear Gloria's program. She is an active member of our board and we are grateful to have her and her expertise. She is the executive director of the Latino Hispanic American Community Center of Greater Harrisburg. Uh, for that entity, she gives or she provides leadership and oversight in her capacity in the past, she has served as the director of the Commonwealth Leadership Development Institute for Women. She sits on the board of several different organizations, including ours. Among them are HACC, CASA, and the Harrisburg Public Schools. She received her bachelor's degree in management studies from Eastern University. Her honors are numerous, among them are the Latino Inspirational Leadership Award. So I am very pleased and delighted to introduce you to our board member, Gloria Merrick. Thank you, David, and thank you, Dorothy, for that introduction. And thank you to the Historic, uh, Harrisburg Historic Association for inviting me to do this. It's interesting because I've been wanting to capture a lot of this information for a few years now. And I've been told that I should start capturing this information for a few years. And so this actually, you know, when Dorothy talked to me, it, it forced me to just get up and just do it. Pull myself up by the bootstraps, do some research and, and begin to gather this information. So I'm anxious to share it with you. And are we all good to go now? Okay. So I wanted to start out by just, uh, I put a title on this that as I was working on this presentation, I wanted to make sure that I was capturing the essence of uh, what we wanted to do here. And at the same time, I'm going to be talking about my childhood growing up and my personal experience. It's almost like I'm, I'm looking out the window, so to speak, and I'm seeing all, you know, everything around me. And uh, so I'm going to be speaking from that perspective, just so that you know. So you're going to give, get my snapshot of my perception of growing up here in Allison Hill and making the connections to leadership and other prominent players in the community that uh, influenced not only me, but a lot of others in the Latino Hispanic community. So with that, we'll go to uh, the next slide. Just to give you an idea of Allison Hill, Allison Hill in Harrisburg, you know, we all hear about Allison Hill, but do we know where is Allison Hill? Allison Hill is in the city of Harrisburg. It goes from Market Street, which is one of the most heavily traveled streets, State Street, Market Street, and Derry Street, the most heavily traveled streets in Harrisburg. So you probably have been in Allison Hill at some time or another, and now you know that by looking at this map. So, um, you can see Market Street runs up there in the north and then Cameron Street to the east. Uh, I'm sorry, Cameron Street is to the west. You can see the border of Cameron Street. 
and going up to Paxton Street down south. You can see Paxton Street running up and it just kind of closes off in a quadrant there to, I believe it is 29th Street. So when we're talking about Allison Hill, that's what we're talking about. And that's where all of the activity, a lot of the activity that I'll be talking about now, it has occurred. Uh, regardless of whether I'm talking about the old Latino Center, the Mount Pleasant Center, or the current center, or if I'm talking about activity at St. Francis or different locations, everything falls within this parameter of Allison Hill. Next slide. So just to give you some uh, information on the demographics uh, and the population, um, the number of Latinos back in the 1980s, when all of this was starting to take off, uh, actually the centers were, were starting to take off in 73. But in the 80s, the population of Harrisburg City was 817. Dauphin County was 3,585. Cumberland County was 867. And Perry County, 138. When you contrast that to 2019, I don't have all the latest data on the uh, 20 census per county, but in um, when we're talking about uh, Dauphin County now, we're looking at 23,315. When we're talking about Perry County, we're talking about 809 people, 809 now in Perry County versus 138 in the 80s. And uh, Cumberland County is now at 11, 1,975 versus 867 back in the 80s. Big difference. Next slide. So there weren't a whole lot of us in Allison Hill, a whole lot of Latinos in Allen. So there were a few, there weren't that many. I mean, there are 800 people, Latinos in the entire city. And so we were one of these families that decided to come here. And I'll tell you a little bit about that in a second in the next slide. But here I am in Allison Hill, right in front of the place where I was born. My brother is standing there putting his hands behind his back because he in no way wants to be holding hands with those two girls standing next to him. Although I think they might wanna be holding hands with him. That's why he's got his hands back here. But there I am, uh, I think I was four years old in this picture. And I still remember the girl there on the right hand side, a dear friend, Wanda. Um, and so when I was born, I, I have such, I have a lot of, fond memories about uh, Honey Street. Uh, I was actually born there because when my family came from Puerto Rico, my mother did not speak English and would not go to the hospital. So I was literally born on this street in a little house right there on the corner of 14 Honey. Next slide. And there were six of us. And this is in the little house that I'm talking about. This is the living room. There's our front door. And these are, are all my siblings and uh, my sister Carmen, my brother George, Jose, Louie, and little Ruben and myself. That's me right there in the front. They used to call me after a boxer, uh, Kusurki, because if you look at me there, I, I, probably, I probably looked like a, a boxer. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so that's all six of us growing up in Allison Hill when we first came here and the first probably within the first four or five years of us being here. So in the next slide, I'll just tell you a little bit about how we got here. So in the next slide, my father, Luis A. Vasquez, he was in San Juan, he was in Puerto Rico, in Otuado, actually, Otuado, Puerto Rico, minding his own business, working in an electrical company there. And the recruiters at that time in the I guess in the 50s, late 50s, we're going to Puerto Rico and recruiting construction workers. And so they came to the, the plant where my father was working uh, and during one of the breaks started talking to them about come, moving to the States, to the mainland. And so he and uh, one of my uncles and a couple of friends uh, decided to take the leap. So they went to New York and they started working construction there. And then they were there for about, my father was there for only about three months. And I was, I'm gonna read something to you that he actually wrote. He said, um, a neighbor friend, Jose Antonio Marchani had made arrangements for people from the Brymort company who had been vacationing in Puerto Rico. So there were people vacationing in Puerto Rico and doing recruitment. And Jose Antonio, another young man and I were given tickets to old LaGuardia airport in New York. And then after about two weeks 
in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, where he had gone to, Frank Turnauer and Alex Gross, whom he met in San Juan, asked us if we wanted to come to Harrisburg. I remember asking for a map and one was produced. When I saw that Harrisburg was the capital of Pennsylvania, I and the other guys thought it had to be a good place to go. And that is how I wound up in Harrisburg. And that was a quote from my father that he wrote years ago. Uh, so we moved here. My mother was Antonia Heredia, and uh, she did a lot of work as a seamstress, working with uh, Kate Greenaway Dress Factory, well, a very prominent dress factory in New York. And Kate Greenaway, some of you might remember, was right there on Vernon Street, at the end of Vernon Street in Harrisburg, in, right in Allison Hill. And a lot of the women from the neighborhood and from the community, I remember, would work in those factories. And so even though we didn't have a lot of money, we really dressed nicely. We had really pretty ruffly dresses. If you know anything about Kate Greenaway dresses back then, they were in, they were like the, the top of the line dresses for children. So if there was a hem out or a seam wasn't right, they would go down to the basement and the ladies would all like start buying and, you know, and uh, purchase some of those dresses. And so I wore some hand-me-down Kate Greenaway dresses, but I didn't mind. <laughs> Um, so anyway, then after that, uh, we started getting more involved and more involved at St. Francis. Uh, St. Francis of Assisi is like a beacon, uh, was a beacon for help for the community. And for a lot, of, um, a lot of ethnicities, not just the Latino community. Um, but the difference was that a lot of the other groups over there spoke English and we didn't. And so the services weren't held in Spanish there. Um, but anyway, so I wanted to mention St. Francis, and I'll come back and talk about St. Francis of Assisi. Uh, I went to St. Francis for eight years. Um, I went to Bishop McDevitt, and a lot of my friends were from the home, Sylvan Heights home up there on Summit Street in, uh, in Allison Hill. But I will say that we got to St. Francis because even though there was a slight fee involved, my father would, would, he would wash the windows, he would fix the roof, he would do everything that he could possibly do. And he went to the bishop and he said, all of my children will go to Catholic school. All of my children go, go through St. Francis, right bishop? And bishop would say yes. And he'd say, and all my children are gonna go through Bishop McDevitt High School, right bishop? And he'd say, yes, they are. And so it was a lot of bargaining that went on. And uh, it's interesting how, you know, we did pretty well and it was a, a lot due to a lot of the, the, like I said, the bartering and the things that uh, my father would do, my mother would work the cafeteria, and my one brother reminds me how he used to, he painted the, be the bleachers at McDevitt, and so we kind of worked our way through, earning our way through going to uh, good, nice schools. Next slide. And so this is a picture of the Beacon Church, which still rests in Allison Hill. You probably go by it a lot of times and just don't think about, you know, what that church means to so many thousands and thousands that have come through that church. St. Francis of Assisi Parish, uh, that was our parish for many, many years. And, you know, we would go there for meetings and we'd go there for activities. And that's where I started my servant leadership. I actually, as a, um, I think back, you know, my servant leadership and my fathers and a lot of other Latino leaders in the community, they started right here at this church and, uh, you know, having meetings in uh, downstairs in the basement. And since they didn't have Spanish masses, we would actually go across the street to the convent. And there was a convent there where they would have the masses in Spanish. And they would also have the masses down in St. James and Steelton. And some of you might remember that. What was really nice about that is now you could go to mass, you could go to church services, and you could go in Spanish. And I have, uh, you know, I, I remember I, with great detail, you know, sitting in those uh, pews and, and uh, you know, going through the services in Spanish. Next slide. So as I mentioned, a lot of the community leaders evolved uh, or came through that church, came through the Church of St. Francis. Now we had leaders that came from elsewhere too, but I have to say that the evolution of the first Latino center in Allison Hill was due to a lot of these gentlemen who were cruciistas. And there they have a banner of St. Francis of Assisi. I would imagine that they're having a uh, procession. We had a lot of processions that we would carry 
the banners and statues throughout all of Addison Hill. Um, it was really, it was really just um, people would just join in, and before you knew, it, you had a you know, mile-long procession. And these uh, these gentlemen here were a part of that. And as I look at it, I see a lot of familiar faces. I do see my father there, the second one there from the banner on the right. Um, I see George Pereira and a lot of others that even still today have become very influential in our community. And so I just wanted to point out, I think it's very important to, to note that these, these guys right here like started it all. They started it all and it's just, uh, I was so excited when I talked to George Pereira, the second one from the left in the picture with the beard or the goatee. And I, I texted him, he's in Puerto Rico now. And I said, hey, George, I said, do you have any pictures of you when you were in St. Francis, when you guys were starting all of this work in the Latino community? He says, As a matter of fact, I do. And he sent me this picture and, and I, I think it's great. So we'll talk a little bit more about these leaders and what they eventually did. So next slide. So uh, what, what these leaders did, and, and I'll talk about it as we're looking at this particular slide. Um, they, like I said, they started it all. They were meeting in the kitchen. Like I remember them getting together in our kitchen. I remember that they would meet at different homes. I remember that they would meet on Dairy Street at a place that is directly across the street from our Latino Center, where it is right now on Dairy Street, directly across the street. I look and I see this building and sometimes I can almost see them coming out of the building with their little tablets and notebooks and in my, in my imaginary way, you know, it, it keeps me really grounded and rooted in why I'm doing what I'm doing and the legacy that I'm carrying on for them. And uh, so I, I think that that's something you know, special to note how they were very persistent. They were tenacious. They, were, they, they felt like they had a call to action and they would talk about it, but then they were, do, they were also doers. And from those conversations evolved the Puerto Rican Organizing Committee in Harrisburg. And that's very important to note that the first Latino group, Hispanic group of men in the community, men and women in the community was called the Puerto Rican Organizing Committee. That Puerto Rican Organizing Committee continued to work hard, very tenaciously, and uh, they would not give up. They hit roadblocks, they hit barriers, but you know, they would talk to different leaders in the community. For example, um, I remember when they got this building, my father would say to me, you know, Fanny Kresge was on the school board and when I went to her and I told her we needed a place for our Puerto Rican organizing committee to formalize and to become a place where everyone in the community could go for help. And she gave him the Webster School on 13th Street for $1 a month. And uh, you know that was the start of the Latino Center on 13th Street, and it was called the Mount Pleasant Hispanic Center. So um, next slide, please. So as that committee continued to grow and uh, they started to build this center on 13th Street, which became Mammoth, um, they, they started meeting with a lot of the politicals in the area, a lot of politicians in the area. I remember George Geekus, and I had fond memories of George Geek as a very good friend of the family he became. And uh, when they would have their processions, they also had the parades. And when they would have the parades going up and down Market Street, well, mostly up Market Street from downtown, he would jump out of the parade and he would go and he would go to our kitchen where my mother was usually cooking or something. And he would lift the lids on the, on the, on the pots and he would say, oh, senora, he was asking her, what was she cooking today? And so in a flash, he would run in the house, go in the kitchen. And now he, now he is heading the parade. Remember, he's like the MC. He's like the master of the parade. And he would stop, come into the house and do that. And then run back out and say, I'm coming back for dinner. <laughs> so uh, here he is, my father. I found this is one of his pictures that, that he had. And he wrote it on the back of this picture. Uh, proclamation 1974 with Mayor Swenson. And I'm not sure who the gentleman is there to the left of him, but uh, the mayor declared a proclamation uh, for, um, that was a proclamation for the Hispanic uh, community. And so next slide. 
there were a lot of other players in the community that weren't in that picture. And, you know, one couple that always uh, resonates with me is uh, Dr. Margarita Morales Kearns and Richard Kearns. He was an attorney and she was a huge advocate for the community. And she was the godmother, if you can imagine, she was the godmother to 70 children from throughout the community. I mean, I don't know if you ever met anyone who was a godmother for 70 children, but that's how, how she would go to people's homes. It didn't matter. She was very unpretentious and, and just loved visiting. Um, and Mr. Kearns did a lot of pro bono work for the community. So they both worked on, um, on establishing the Mount, His the Mount Pleasant Hispanic Center. One from a legal perspective, and then uh, Margarita from a fundraising perspective and just doing overall administry, helping with overall administration. And so I really wanted to mention them as two leaders in the community. Mr. Kearns was not a, um, was not a Latino, but I always say he's like my husband. He, my husband is not a Latino, but they wanna be Latino. <laughs> and so uh, Mr. Kearns would come to the church all the time in St. Francis and he would do pro bono free legal work for a lot of the families from throughout the community. So I wanted to mention those as two leaders that you know, were a huge influence in the Hispanic uh, community there. Next slide. So I wanted to be respectful and I don't know a lot of these players. Um, I don't know, some of them are in the picture that we saw from St. Francis, but these were, um, I got this out of a book that was sent to me from a past president and this book is where I got the cover from, Celebrating 20 Years of Service to the Latino Community. And in this book, this book is fascinating. It has uh, some history, pictures, all kinds of things. And it actually has a page where it lists the founders of the Spanish Speaking Center right there. So there you have it. The founders of the first, uh, the first Spanish Speaking Center, the Mount Pleasant American Center, the founders Luis Vasquez, Jesus Lozada, William Miranda, Pedro Pereira, Irma Fernandez, Juan Brevan, Justo Lopez, and Maria Toledo Monroy. And I wanted to be respectful and mention them because they started it all. They started everything at the center. And then, uh, of course, you had to have presidents and you had to have executive directors. So on the next slide, you also see some influential uh, members of the community. They were the first presidents of the Puerto Rican Organizing um, Committee. And you may see some familiar names here. I know Hilvio Otio, Frente Garcia, uh, Roberto Torres, and uh, George Pereira, and, uh, and my father, Alba Weiss, uh, also, and Carlos Garcia. And Manuel Olives, and I do remember Manuel Olives. He was a doctor, Dr. Manuel Olives, and he did a lot of work in the Latino community there in Allison Hill, again, doing a lot of health and wellness and uh, quality of life type of work, just as some others did. So I wanted to be respectful and mention uh, the presidents. And then on the next page are the executive directors. And you might see some familiar names here as well. And there's Margarita and Camille uh, Iris, um, which some of you may know, and I'll mention her in another moment. So again, just I think it's very important that you know, we, we mentioned them as a part of this conversation. Next slide. And so here I uh, mentioned Camille and Camille actually went on to, you know, besides all the work that she was doing in the Allison Hill community, she went on to, uh, you know, she founded the uh, Danzante, which helped to preserve the, the arts and share our traditions in Allison Hill and keep them alive for many, many years through performances and giving lessons and teaching kids how to do, you know, the, all the dances and just a lot of different things. And you can see also here during this time, and this is getting into the, the uh, 90s now, we have Steve Reed. Steve Reed, who was another influential leader and we had Mayor Swinson and we had Stephen Reed. And here he is at a book fair, attending a book fair in 1991 at the Latino, uh, at the His Mount Pleasant, Hispanic American Center. Next slide. So uh, well, the center did a lot of different things. I mean, the center was just very active. 
and probably did a lot more things than I'm able to do right now at the Latino Hispanic American Community Center, which is a smaller version of the Mount Pleasant Hispanic Center. But, um, you know, here, here's my father here with um, Kid Gallivan, who is a Cuban boxer. And he was a famous fighter back in, in the day. And they say he was one of the, the uh, 26 uh, greatest fighters of the 80s. And um, so there were a lot of prominent people that would come to the center. In the center there, there is uh, Ron Snyder. And I can't remember, I believe he was with, um, with the uh, state police, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, so famous people, people from all over would come to the center and show their support. Uh, they also did, they offered so many services there. I mean, they even had organizations coming to the center that would then do their work from the center. Next slide. Uh, another uh, very influential volunteer from the community in the 1990s, I believe it was around 1995, you know, um, Secretary Cortez was a volunteer at the Latino, at the um, uh, Mount Pleasant Hispanic Center. And he started, he started there. He, he was just started there. He came from Carolina, Carolina, Puerto Rico. And he always would tell us about his humble beginnings in Carolina, Puerto Rico. And he would share those stories with, even today, he, he, uh, he just moved to Florida, but even up to now, he would come and share his stories. Um, but he went on, I mean, just to show you how these, these leaders from Allison Hill went on to do bigger and greater things. And very proud of Pedro Cortez, you know, Honorable Pedro Cortez, and he became the first Latino secretary of the Com of, a, of the uh, Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And so we're very proud of him and all the work that he's done and uh, and continued to do long after he became secretary of state. Um, the thing about Pedro, he always remembered his beginnings, and he would. Uh, continue, even after becoming Secretary of State, continue to say, you know, Gloria, what do you need at the center? How can I help? And, and I came back one day and I told him how he could help. And I'll tell you about that in, the, in another slide. But we also have in that picture, um, uh, next slide, another prominent individual that came out of Allison Hill, you know, working in Allison Hill. He was 26 years old when he came from the Bronx, New York. And he, I talked to him the other day, you know, because I, you know, I do know Robert, we are friends. And uh, I said, Robert, what can you tell me? When did you start at the center? He says, I was 26 years old. I didn't know anything. <laughs> I didn't know anything. I didn't have anything. I just like, came out to help out. And uh, it's a fascinating story. You know, he went on to work and eventually got his law degree, just like uh, Secretary Torres did, or Secretary Cortez did, got his law degree. And uh, he ended up, uh, when Secretary Cortez left the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, Robert was his, uh, his um, deputy, you know, his executive uh, secretary, executive assistant. And um, so he was the, the deputy and he actually became the acting Secretary of State. So here we are, individuals from Allison Hill that were helping from the very beginning and uh, here they aspired to become very influential and prominent members in our community. Next slide. And not to be forgotten, Dr. Dr. Manjan, some of you may recognize him as the owner of Tres Cubanos Restaurant. Do you know that he started the first uh, clinic? He ran the first clinic, health clinic, at the Mount Pleasant Hispanic Center. So he is a, uh, a surgeon. And he is a volunteer at the center doing uh, pro bono work. And, um, you know, he ends up uh, staying in Allison Hill. Well, he's outside of Allison Hill in the Shy Poke area with the Tres Cubanos restaurant. And then my friend, uh, George Pereira. Uh, George Pereira went on to become a deputy mayor in a Cedra, uh, municipality of Cedra, Puerto Rico. And I'll tell you, you know, he's in that photo as one of the first shining stars in the group with the red jackets, the Cruciistas. And, uh, you know, just goes to show how he expanded his footprint, not only within the Harrisburg area and the greater Harrisburg area, but going to Puerto Rico 
and now being able to use all of his experience and everything he did, did here to do in a bigger way as a deputy mayor. And I think that's really exciting and uh, we we're really proud of him as well. And when we were helping all of the clients from Puerto Rico, we had about 400 families that came here from Puerto Rico because of the hurricane. You know, George sent me a proclamation from the mayor of Sijas, Puerto Rico, saying the mayor wanted to thank you. Myself and the mayor wanted to thank you at the Latino Center for all of you have done for all of our people from Sijas and from other municipalities that have been suffering from the hurricane here that, that hit Hurricane Maria that hit here in Puerto Rico. And the next slide, another, uh, another influential player in the um, influential leader is, is seated here, Yolanda Perez. Uh, Yolanda Perez uh, was very active with the Latino Center, the Mount Pleasant Hispanic Center. She helped with the bylaws. She was chair of the uh, bylaws committee. And you know she's doing a humble work, working with the community and she becomes a, um, she becomes a, um, the professor, counselor emeritus at the Harrisburg Area Community College. And she goes on to do big things and expands her footprint to not only helping people in Allison Hill and, and in the communities here, but now helping college students. And so we're, we're very proud of her as well. And then Dr. Raleigh Dominic is actually uh, right now is a key player in the community in the 2000s, let's say in the 2000s. Next slide. So the, the interesting thing is that the Mount Pleasant Hispanic Center was doing phenomenal things. And then in right around 2005, 2006, after, uh, I think 2003, after 33 years, the, the center became so massive. There, were, there was so much going on at the center that the, the, the maintenance of the building, the funds for, the, for you know, to be able to provide all of these services and everything started to take a toll on that center. And that center actually closed, sadly closed in 2006. And so even though that center closed, it's not the end of the legacy. It's not the end at all, because luckily we had um, we had the foresight, uh, a lot of the other Latino leaders in the community had the foresight to see that something still, need, we just still need to have something to fill the void in the community. And so what happens is that there's an Adelante study that's provided by the United Way of the Capital Region. And it shows that when that center closed, it not only was a sad day, but it left a huge void in that there were many, many, many thousands of people that were getting help through that center that now had no place to go. And so that Adelante study led to the startup of another Latino center. And that is the Latino center that I am happy to say that I am able to continue to work with today. And so then the, when the Mount Pleasant Center closed, the Latino Hispanic American Community Center evolved after much research, after an Adelante study and a lot of other work that was done that proved, because we had to prove that there was a void in the community. So they conducted hundreds and hundreds of interviews and started asking people in the community, who's doing your translating? Who's referring you for help? Who's referring you for, for clothing, for, for food, for rental assistance? Who's, who's, you know, who's helping you? And the answer was no one. And so the other part of that equation is that even when they started to go places on their own, the translation services and the ability for people to communicate was very minimal. So it might mean, well, let me go get the kitchen help and maybe they can translate. Or let me go get the secretary because she's bilingual and maybe she can translate. So if you can imagine going to all these different places now because you don't have somebody to refer you and to help you and you go to these places and you cannot get the help. So that became a huge barrier. And so uh, the Latino Hispanic American Community Center was then, if you see that the center closed in 2006, the Mount Pleasant Hispanic Center, 
It left a three-year gap, only a three-year gap. And in 2009, um, Hector Ortiz and a group uh, formed a, um, a committee, a founding committee of a new center called the Latino Hispanic American Community Center. Next slide. And so here is a, a photo of uh, Dr. Hector Ortiz, who I like to say, you know, kind of, you know, they, the torch was passed on to Hector and he started another founding committee. And I was happy to be a part of that founding board along with Mark Hogan and a lot of others from throughout the community. And so, so this is amazing. It's really amazing. It's a real blessing that even though the other center did close that, you know, we had Latinos leaders that hurried up and, and, and uh, you know, just stepped up to the plate and said, we can't, we, we have to have something. And like I said, uh, we started a new center. And so what are we doing at the Latino Center? So we're, next slide. And so at the Latino Center, you know, we are doing a lot of the things that were done at the previous center, um, but in a smaller way. I mean, we still have our events, we still have our activities, we still focus on health and wellness, we still focus on, you know, vaccines, the pandemic, and all of the things that are critical. And I'd like to say we have kind of like just in time events, you know, just in time events, like, you know, when we have to do something, then those, that's when we do it, because we don't have the capacity to have people move into our building, and like, you know, different health organizations and things like that. And so, um, one of the things that I said to Roberto Torres, who is now the Secretary of Aging for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, and he is still on my board, he actually still serves on the ALHAC board now, when he came to me and he said, Gloria, he said, they're starting a new center and I think you should be a part of it. You know, your father started a center and I think you, you should really be there. So I had just left government and I thought I'll go somewhere and hang my hat and volunteer for a little bit. And um, that was in 2010 and I've been there ever since. And so I said to Robert, well, I think it's important that we provide services to the community that are gonna have to sustain the families and you know, food, clothing, shelter, jobs, and all those kinds of things. But we need to do some program, empowerment programs for the community. And so I went to Secretary, um, I went to Secretary Cortez, who you see in the picture here, and he was Secretary of State. I called him up and I said, Secretary Cortez, I need to meet with you. <laughs> and he said, okay, Gloria, what's up? I told him, I said, I, we need to start a program to continue the legacy. We need to have Latino youth need to be trained. We need to work with other generations. There are, are a lot of generations um, that are, are, are coming you know, ahead of us here and they need to have future leaders. We're not gonna be here forever. And so I did a Shark Tank pitch and I have to say it was just like Shark Tank. I went in with all the posters and why he should do this, this and that. And, you know, what it's gonna do for the community, what it's gonna do for the youth and what it looks like. And so he actually became the champion uh, for our LISTO program. And so now I'm excited that since 2016, well, we started working on the program in 2014 and 2016, we kicked off the Leadership Institute Start Training Opportunity Program, which is designed to create future leaders now for future generations. And uh, this is a picture of Manny. Manny uh, had, uh, is a high school student who completed our program and their secretary Cortez, because the first program he gave out the certificates. And then you can see there on the right, he included his own Commonwealth of Pennsylvania Secretary of State proclamation. So the, the our certificate uh, of recognition for, the, for the, uh, the students. Next slide. And so this is uh, one of our first class of students. They were doing a cleanup day and we got a picture and uh, it's really exciting. We have close to 100 youth that have now graduated from our program. And when these youth come to our program, it's really interesting because a lot of them have never been leaders of anything. And they'll tell you, even though they're in high school, you know, clubs, different organizations they, be, they can belong to. And, you know, we, we ingrain in them the importance of, 
uh, becoming leaders, starting early and becoming leaders within their organizations and, and in clubs. And so we're, we're so uh, um, just so proud of these youth that you see here in this picture because they are carrying the torch now. And uh, this class right here that you see, I believe they are all in college now. She, yeah, Shailena's in there. They're all in college now. And, you know, we want them to run for office. We want them to be a part of their community and to be involved, just like all the other leaders before them. Next slide. And so when we talk about the importance of covering all generations, you know, you can see that we work with the little kids, the youth, we work with the high school students, we work with the grandparents, we work with the parents and so on. Because, you know, I was doing, I was reading um, some information on the census for an article I was writing. And one of the things I found in one of the studies is that um, after four generations, after four generations, people forget, they start to forget where they came from. They start wondering, you know, what was their ancestry? What is their heritage? They, they just, they lose sight of it. And so for us at the Latino Center, that's part of our mission. Part of our mission is to preserve the culture, preserve the traditions at all ages, because all ages are gonna have an impact in the future. And uh, in the next slide, you'll see that we, we make sure they have fun while they're learning about their culture. When they come to the festival, you know, we want them to get the, their faces painted. We want them to dance. We want them to learn, learn and hear stories from our seniors and we want them to dance and everything. And so you can see some of the little ones here. Um, they may not remember a whole lot about that day, but they're gonna remember about going to a Hispanic Heritage Festival and having a lot of fun. And, you know, that goes a long way to helping them and instilling memories in them that they're gonna remember their heritage and they're, they're gonna remember where they came from. Next slide. And so I talked about all the generations and the importance of including all generations in our whole um, effort to, um, to maintain culture and traditional life for many years to come. And so when I developed the youth program, uh, in 2016, I had also met with the grandparents and the elders in the community because I thought that was important. Um, I remember my mother and I remember her struggles. And, you know, I remember, you know, I remember a lot of things. And when I see the grandparents, they remind me of my family. And, uh, you know, it, it really, they have a special place in my heart. And so I said, I met with them and I said, what do you guys, what would, what would you like to learn about? And the seniors, these seniors said, you know, we want to get together. We want to make friends with other Latinos in the community. We want to socialize. We want fellowship. We want to share in our cultures. And I say that because a lot of people think about the Hispanic community, the Latino community as a whole, but we are many cultures. We're a big melting pot. We're many cultures within the ethnicity. We, like right here, you can see um, Don Ambrosio, he's from Guatemala. America is from Puerto Rico. Maria is from um, Mexico. Maria in the back, she's from Ecuador and, uh, and so on. They're from all different countries. And so they get together and it's so funny because they, they uh, you know, they'll be talking about their culture and they'll say, well, we do that in our country or we do that better in our, our country. Or, we can cook that better. <laughs> and it's so funny to hear them sharing their, um, it's called sharing wisdom. Um, it's the sharing wisdom program. That's exactly what they do. And so uh, we don't want our seniors to be left behind and they get together every week. And uh, you can see here, we're uh, celebrating Hispanic heritage with them. And if we work with them, if we work with these seniors, we will make sure that everything that they have uh, learn throughout their entire lives, and a lot of them are in the 70s and 80s now, that they're going to pass that down to other generations, and that's what we instill in them. We tell our seniors it's very important that you pass this down to all the other generations in your family, and that's what we do. So besides providing basic human needs, we provide uh, services for our youth, 
and we provide services for our grandparents and our seniors. And uh, right now during the pandemic, I'm proud to say that we provided, our little center has provided nearly 25,000 services to the community. And uh, we're continuing to do that to this day. Next slide. And so there you have it. We are the Latino Hispanic American Community Center. We've evolved from the work of many, many leaders in the past, and we continue to make leaders for the future. And we are right now, we are many leaders bringing this all together and uh, trying to create a, an, an, create a legacy, not only for the current Latino community and the center and everything it does, but for many generations to come. And that's all I have for tonight. And I'll take any questions that you might have. All right, I'm looking at our Facebook live video. So if you tuned in on Facebook in the comments under the chat for the video, you can post any questions that you'd like to ask Gloria. And maybe while we're waiting to see if any of our participants have some questions, um, Gloria, you talked a lot about the history of the Hispanic community in Harrisburg. Can you just take a minute and discuss kind of where you see things going in the future, post COVID with the pandemic, um, and kind of where what you see happening in that community in the next coming years or decades or what have you? Gloria, yeah, well, before you before you answer that question, I was so remiss and not saying happy Hispanic history month to you i am so sorry i did not say that so happy hispanic history month to you and to everyone listening and i'm so sorry please answer oh, the question don't don't feel bad don't feel bad dorothy you know i had to take my husband to a german oktoberfest this weekend and so i i had i, I you know sometimes i had to remind be reminded not to be rem, uh, you know remiss of uh, <laughs> the importance of him celebrating his culture too so that's fine um, and, but getting back to Ashley's uh, question, um, where are we going now? I think where we're headed now is, first off, we have to continue doing what we're doing. The Latino community in, in, in remember, we're located in Allison Hill. And so I'm speaking on behalf of, you know, the community and the, the, that we serve. Um, there's always needs. There's always basic human needs. And it's very cyclical. It's extremely cyclical. Like I, I can, like when I see parents coming in, I see myself, my mother, my brothers, I see my family and I see that we made it. I see we made it. And so I think one of the things we have to continue to do is to, well, first off, I think the greater community, um, I'm hoping they understand that it is cyclical that when we have clients come into the center, we may, we may help them for a year, two years, three years. And then it's like, like letting, uh, uh, you know, a bird fly away when it gets its wings, you know? And so that's why I think it's so important for people, um, for us to continue doing what we're doing. We're not helping the same families for five, 10 years. We're helping families and we're turning them loose into society and they're having a big impact and they're doing want to do, do greater things because we instill in them confidence, we instill in them pride, and we instill in them the feeling that they can make it and they're going to make it. And I think about those six little kids that I showed you on that couch in the beginning. That was my family. All of us went on, all six of us went on to do wonderful work my brothers, my sister, and that's what we're all about. So I think that what we have to continue to do is exactly what we're doing. We need to continue instilling hope, instilling pride in the Latino, Hispanic, and American community so they can go off and have a bigger footprint so we can have more Pedro Secretary Cortez, more Secretary Torres, we can have more Yolanda Perez, we can have more of everyone, you know? And so that's the thing that we, we may seem like a small center 
And we may seem like we're doing something very basic, but we're providing basic human needs for, for individuals. And we are giving them the boost they need to go out and do great things. And so I, I answer your question, Ashley, I think we keep doing what we're doing. And then I think we also have to adjust, be flexible, and we have to be able to realign our center with the needs of the day, such as the pandemic, such, well, such as we do with the youth programming. There was no program, programming for youth. We put that in place. There was no programming for our seniors to help improve their quality of life. We put that in place. Now with the pandemic, what I'm seeing is a huge need for workforce development, for helping people find jobs, for helping employers find employees. And they're coming to us. So we're working with about 40 companies right now that are looking for individuals to come work for them. So that's where I see us on the short term uh, coming out of this pandemic. I think continue to do vaccines, continue to help people get tested, continue to help people prevent from getting even the flu coming up now, because some people are saying, well, I got my vaccine, I don't need my flu shot. So we're doing a lot of educating and you know, during the pandemic and, and uh, trying to keep our community healthy, but then we're also trying to keep them healthy and sustainable from a monetary standpoint. And so Ashley, we just keep doing what we're doing, but we keep doing it in a bigger way. Thank you so much, Gloria. Um, we have gotten so many comments on the Facebook video. Uh, some folks are saying they didn't know any of this history, um, that, that this is a great lecture, uh, that they just didn't know the history of Hispanics in Harrisburg and how much they've done for the city, how much service they've done. Wendy did ask a question. Mm -hmm. Is there a way I can donate to the Hispanic Center? Will I find a, donut bu a donate button on your website? Oh, that's always a good question. And uh, you can go, Wendy, thank you for asking that question. And uh, Wendy, you can go right to our website at uh, www.lhacc.org. L-H-A-C-C, that's hack with an L in front of it. L-H-A-C-C.org. And maybe we can put that in the chat, um, if, Ashley. Uh, so you can go to lhack.org. And there is a uh, drop down there for donations. And we would be happy to put your donation to good use. Um, we have individuals that give us $10 um, a month, $15 a month. We have individuals that go in there. I had an individual, God bless him, from Elizabethtown College, Dr. Shorn and his wife. They donated their um, the, the money that was given by the federal government to all of the families because of the pandemic, they donated that to the center because they said they knew we would put it to good use helping the community. And so we welcome that, Wendy, and anyone else out there listening. Um, you know, I, when I have a festival, Wendy, um, my, West, my festival is my major fundraiser. And a lot of people don't know that. That festival that we held, that Hispanic Heritage Festival, we raised money because all of the corporations and companies that were there that wanted to meet the community front and center, they gave us donations to make the event happen. And a part of the proceeds of that will definitely help our center and any donations that you give are definitely going to do the same. So thank you. All right, great. And we did post that website link onto the comments. So everyone- Thank you, that. Ashley. Um, I can interject something if we don't have a question while I was doing this presentation. Well, there's two things I wanted to mention that when we were little and growing up in Allison Hill, we didn't have a whole lot. We really did not. And it was through our experience growing up and through our family and and uh, my father and all the effort that he had to make that I think he realized that there were a lot of other families out there just like us. And so that's, I think that was kind of his motivation for wanting to help the community. But I, and when I talk about us not having a whole lot, it's because, not because, you know, we, you know, we want to 
you know, not a whine or complain or anything, because I can tell you everything that I have gone through my entire life has helped me be where I am today. I wouldn't be where I am today had I not gone through that experience. But I do remember how, and I tell you this because it's a small world, but when uh, my mother would give me $5 and she would say, now go up to Bernstein's store and see what you can get for $5 for dinner. I think we can get some spaghetti and a little hamburger and some sauce. And then sometimes, you know, I would go up to the, the, the little store and I'd say, Mr. Bernstein, you know, I need to get stuff for dinner and, you know, and here's what I have. And he'd help me put it together. And then sometimes we didn't have any money. And my mother would say, you go up to Bernstein's grocery store and you tell him that we don't have $5 today, but that your father will be there to fix the roof or fix the windows or paint or do whatever he needs done. And Mr. Bernstein will put a bag together for me quickly and send it to the house. And my father would go there and fix a window or fix the roof or do whatever. And it's so funny because uh, when people ask me, how did I learn to barter like I do? And I said, because I used to do bartering when I was 10 years old. I would go and, and, and watch how um, my family would barter for, for assistance and, and barter for help. And so that's, that's a little story you know, that, I, that I wanted to share. And I have so many little stories like that. But um, when, another story is that when I was doing this presentation, and I remember this one person, uh, um, Zozo, Dimitri Zozo. And I remember because um, you know, he was our paper boy. And he started sending me a list of all these memories he had. So I think, uh, I think that's a cute story because he was a paper boy and he taught my brother, my brother became, my brothers became paper boys. <laughs> and so uh, that helped them make a little money. But uh, I thought it was interesting because when I was doing this, he started sending me a long list about all these places in Allison Hill and what the, and, and uh, so I'm gonna have to get together with him, but maybe we'll have to do a sequel, David. We'll have to do a, a yes. sequel and, and share more stories um, about the community. Indeed. Um, we don't have any other questions. It looks like Wendy did check in and say she donated. So thank that's you, great. Wendy. Thank you, Wendy. Uh, David, did you want to ask your question? You had posted one to the group chat about a possible 50th anniversary. Yes. Uh, um, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, good. Wonderful. First of all, Gloria, that was fantastic. That I loved every bit of it. I learned a lot, and I hope all, our, all of our audience did. And yes, we'll have to do follow-ups. Follow and, and Dimitri Zozo said, wow, the Greek community is an amazing community in Harrisburg. So uh, I'm yeah. full of ideas. But my question has to do with this. When I heard you mention that the original Latino Center was founded in 1973, and your father was instrumental in the founding of it, uh, there was, a, there was a, an interlude. And then the current center was established uh, in what year? In 2010, July 2010. There, okay. was a, there was a gap, a three-year gap. A two-year gap. Well, three-year gap. I'm wondering, 1973 is the year that Historic Harrisburg Association was founded, and we're looking forward to a 50th anniversary in 2023. Does your sense of history tell you that service to the Latino community could be measured in terms of going back to 1973? Or are we talking two totally separate organizations? Well, I think that we're talking two separate organizations with a very similar mission. Yes. And, and similar vision. A vision, I'd like to think that we are fulfilling the vision that their mission had. So when you have a mission and a vision, I think we're an extension of it, even though we are a separate entity and we're a separate organization, we share very like missions. And so, yes, it, it, it would be, um, it would be, uh, it would be phenomenal, it would, it would be great. It would be very beneficial to celebrate the fact that that first center was established 50 years ago in, in 2023. 
you know, the, the gap of, of a couple of years and all that to me doesn't matter. It's the fact that the, the, the vision and the mission started almost 50 years ago and to celebrate that and all those founders, your father and the others, I, I think there's, we can talk about it, but, but mm -hmm. my sense of history tells me that something should be done. Well, that's a good, that's a good thought, David. I'm glad you brought that up because when you think about it, there is some continuity there that some of the same leaders, like your Yolanda and Robert and some of the same leaders that were helping the Mount Pleasant Center are still on the founding board of this center and are still hopping the center. So that does make sense. There is some continuity there. And, and, and that doesn't stop you from celebrating anniversary of, of LHAC, that center right. as well. So you can do right. both. Exactly, absolutely, <laughs> we can do both. Great. So is there anything else, uh, Ashley? I don't have any other questions, so. Okay. You guys let me know. Well, Dorothy, is there anything you wanted to uh, conclude with, Dorothy or David? I just would say, oops, I just would say thank you so much. Um, I can remember when we talked about this a year ago, and, and you've done it, and it's wonderful, and thank you so much. You're welcome. You're welcome, absolutely. And uh, oops, I'm glad, sorry, I'm I, glad I, you, I was I'm I didn't glad you challenged I me. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, Dorothy, I have to thank you. Um, you for challenging me to put something like this in into writing and there's this could be even evolve into something bigger and uh, I'm glad you got it started so thank you and David thank you, you to you too for all you do and uh, you know for uh, as the executive director of historic uh, Harrisburg well, thank you, Gloria. You and I thank know you. what it's like to be an executive director, and we wouldn't do it <laughs> if we didn't love what we do, and we didn't love the cause we work for, and if we didn't have great volunteers like 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 Dorothy and all the people you mm -hmm. mentioned at the center. But uh, I think since we've been collaborating the last several years, that has led to, I think, bringing the Hispanic uh, culture and heritage of Harrisburg out into the broader Harrisburg community mm -hmm. and, and building the connection between, you know, one community and the broader community. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's been wonderful. We've loved coming to your festival the last several yes. years. Uh, Ashley was there uh, earlier this month. I've been there many other times in past years. And uh, it really is something that we all should own and embrace. And I, I hope tonight's audience realizes that it, that this is for all of us and mm -hmm. that's kind of what what you are doing by spreading the word and 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 sharing this great heritage so thank you um thank you again and thank you to all our listeners and all our viewers out there thank you so much and you know come out and volunteer you know we're giving food out every tuesday to 200 families every tuesday from uh around 3 30 to 4 30 so come join us and, uh, you know, the phone number for our center is 717-232-8302. If we can be of any help to any of your friends or families, uh, send them our way. And if you want to volunteer, just give a call and uh, just ask for me or Facebook me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, it's been a great night. Thank you so much, everyone. I appreciate you having me on. Thank you. Good Thank night. you. Good night.